suppose the smart thing to do is get an introduction, some kind of music. <laughs> We're making it there. We're not there yet. You know what? I don't do this very often on the podcast because I like making clips of it and not having the soundtracks, but it's one of those days where I think we could do with a little background. What the hey? Let me know if the levels work for you guys. Uh, yeah, I, my blue screen of death lost the computer a little while back and uh, had to reinstall everything. As I as I go through, get this stuff all done, I start to realize how many things I'm missing. I'm missing your guys' text on the wall. I was missing the ads on this thing. I'm missing everything, but we're gonna get it. We're getting it all back slowly but surely. Yes, so don't call me Shirley, you know the gimmick. Hopefully enjoying your Saturday if you guys are on the workout and that. We're, we're a few minutes behind, but I figure if uh, if the fresh, fresh and if the White Claw boys can handle it, I think you can handle it. I am the beanie. What in the heck did I walk into? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, yeah, Governor, I was gonna wear the new Red Morning merch. I can't find the damn thing. That's actually kind of one of the reasons I'm late. I wore it. I'm like, oh, this is all right. I kind of get into it. And then uh, I'll save it. I was going to wear it yesterday for the uh, for the zombie stream. And then I'm like, nah, I'll wear it for the podcast. And then for the life of me, I can't remember where the fuck I left it. So, yeah, the merch is out. It's ready. Store.ryanstone.com. The T-Rex stuff has been retired. And now we're on the, the Red Morning merch. Yeah, it's like the guitar amp. It got thrown out. Technically, that was my mom gave it to a friend for helping move a TV. Hey, you want to give me a 15-minute task? Let me give you a 1970s vintage amplifier as a thank you. It's just some old thing. I'm sure Ryan won't like it. You son of a bitch. Uh, washed mine yesterday. Thought about wearing this morning, but didn't want to work out and get it all dirty already. I want to get it all beat up. That's the thing. One of you guys sent me a thing. I don't know what you guys did in the wash, but one of you has a hoodie. And I guess all of the uh, the print on the front, the T-Rex stuff around the back, just got torn up. And he's like, oh, my thing got ruined in the wash. I'm like, how the hell do you do that? But I was like, I love that. That's They call it like adding like salt, a little crust to your, crust to your kit. But enough about that. So I've got a pretty good show lined up for you. You guys are going to get that red pill knowledge that nobody ever told you about, but you will learn. I figured it was frame because everybody keeps asking about frame and f nobody really defines frame, you know? Everybody loves to talk about frame, to have frame, and it's just expected. And this is why marketers, I hate marketing because everybody has just assumed then that you'll fill it in with whatever goodness is in your value system, you know? Like, yeah, the, this is good and this is good. So this is frame and this is frame and that's not frame. And guys talk about it. They can't get it right. They're like, yeah, I had frame. And then my wife whittled me down. Or I had frame with this girl. And then she, like, if you had frame and lost it, then you never had frame. I think Wine More Please put it best. Frame isn't something you have. It's who you are. And I'm, I'm kind of leaning heavy on this analogy I've got to, to get people to understand it. Just think of a house. Like, you know, framing, like how to frame a house, the, the wood brackets that make little boxes and whatever. So whatever frame you have, that's what your house is going to look like, period. And it's the same thing for you. But instead of lumber, it's like a, a collection of mental models or a worldview. You get it? Now, it's not like the secret where you can think and you can make it believe. It just, it's how you react to things. Because, I mean, most things in the world are kind of subjective. Like, there's no fight or flight single answer. We've left that kind of, like, binary how to live life thing behind in the Paleolithic times once we discovered agriculture. The frame isn't a health bar, it's a heads-up display. I didn't want to get too gamer with it, because it that kind of gets convoluted after a while, but yeah. And then, it's funny, because I had totally forgotten about it for the longest time, but there was actually a really nice thing on the married red pill about frame it's called the tetrahedron of frame because it's like for every six months to a year the entire group tended to get hyper focused on a single aspect of of red pill so at one point it was just about dread everything was dread and then frame and then everything was about frame and they essentially got mined and then usually coming out of the end of it there was always like 
a bunch of theories that kind of wrapped it all together. It made it pretty interesting. I kind of liked how it worked. Yeah, see, this is why I didn't want to go to, uh, this is why I didn't want to go to hardcore on the metaphors. Now you guys are talking about the hurricanes and reading <laughs> Rolo's book and a Honda Civic. Now that's frame. Is that a 33 secrets jab, sir? If I didn't know any better, I'd say you're taking a quick jab at 33 secrets. Okay, so for my lineup, uh, I'm going to talk about how utility is more important than truth. Then archetypes of the red pill, which is good. And then we're going to get into dread, frame, the hamster. I don't know. We'll kind of tap into them. We'll see. We'll play it by ear. We'll play it by ear. Oh, my girl got this new type of coffee. It's some like rainforest thing. It actually has like a sweet berry taste to it, which is nice, but it's pre-ground. I hate pre-ground. Maybe it's the ritual of me grinding my own coffee. Maybe it's like the staleness that comes after doing it. I just don't like it. Anywho, um, in the chat, I'm seeing a couple new faces, so it's good to see you. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to like. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're wondering who the hell this guy is, well, let me tell you, sir. Uh, I got all kinds of friends. Charles Bukowski. Jordan Peterson. Neil Strauss. I like these guys. Add some salt to cover up the bitterness of middle-aged soccer moms and put in the oven for 45 minutes. Optionally, you can take from all this stuff what you want and leave the rest. So enjoy Fuck Files. 15 lessons from a decade of women, is, now on audio. I used to have the game. When I first bought it, it was like, it came in like a plastic covering that looks like a leather Bible cover. And I lent it to my friend once. He's like, oh, I, that pickup stuff looks kind of fun. I want to try it. I'm like, oh, well, here's the game. It'll get you started. And he kept it. He never got, he never did give it back. And he was horrible with game. He ended up with some French chick, French sailor. I mean, she was cute, I guess. I want to call her Ellie, but I can't remember what her name was. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, they started dating. And then every time, and it was like the funniest thing. So he's like, yeah, I'm learning to pick up. This is fun. And it was kind of like when he first did steroids. He's like, wow, it's a steroids. It's kind of fun, but never really worked out. Never ate better. He still went out drinking with his friends and that. And uh, my volume's a bit low, eh? All right, well, here, I tell you what. I'm gonna... Actually, I guess I just gotta dial it here. Let me turn the limiter on a little higher. Seven, eight, nine. Let's go to 48. That should be low enough where it doesn't really uh, interrupt. <laughs> Taking your amp? No, the amp, the amp wasn't my friend's. That was like a friend of my little sister's from high school. But uh, anyways, the point of this one is he got with this girl. And all of a sudden, every time he wanted to come out with the boys, she started to feel sick or sad or really needed him. And he was a nice guy, you know, nice guy in the Glover way. And every time she started to feel sick, he'd call us up. He's like, guys, I can't go out. Ellie's feeling sick. I, can't, I think that's her name. It doesn't matter. She's feeling sick. I got to take care of her. And everybody's like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do. And then by the fourth time and then the fifth time, and it turns out any time anybody else was going to get any of his attention, she always somehow caught a sickness. <laughs> Ryan Peterson, when I close my eyes. Do I really have the Canadian froggy twang going on right now? I don't know, Senzu. I don't know. I don't know. Just go with his old stuff. Once he became a brand, it kind of, it kind of lost me. Anyways, so that was the funniest thing. And then he figured, I figured this out, is that this is how guys get uh, gaslit into, like, horrible relationships. Now, here's the thing. They had a decent sex life. It wasn't that. It wasn't that she wasn't a good person. It wasn't that she was useless or wasteful or evil or whatever. But she was just so insecure that any time somebody was taking his attention, she would act sick. And then he, she, he would, she would prey on the male protective instinct. And because, to, as far as he was concerned, this is a great girlfriend, we're doing good things together, you know, good sex life, I'm happy. Why wouldn't I take care of her, you know? That's where the, the trad, like, I, why, why would you not take care of your woman? That's what a real man does. And then they don't realize, like, there's no villains in this. There's no villains. But she's basically, like, manipulated the guy into being completely whipped. And that's how it happens. And that's why it happens. And that's why everybody's so bad at it. Move some windows over here. I just realized. 
Now we're going to move on to... The red coats are coming. What the hell, Jack? Dude, one royalty has one hissy fit in your thing and you lose your mind. All right, so we're going to start with utility versus truth here. As story will get you started off there. Where is... There he is. Ian, what do... Not well, Ryan Stone. I'm, I see he's the most important guy in the world. Ryan Stone. Give a fuck about Ryan Stone. Me and him have gone back and forth. Blah, blah, yeah. blah. Ryan Stone does not pass the six foot test. He's not even a man. So I don't give a fuck what Ryan Stone. I'm going to milk the shit out of that one. <laughs> All right. So this part's utility and truth. I see Daniel. I see your thing there. Uh, you don't want that, dude. Every guy, and this is why everybody is such like a weird grifter on like YouTube and Twitter and all the other social media sites, because you don't want anybody to tell you what to do with your life. You don't, because everybody is just going to tell you something that either benefits them or reinforces what they're already doing. Not a single person telling you how to live your life is going to do it for the benefit of you. And so, yeah, it sucks. It's not the answer anybody wants, but that's the real answer is that just go figure it out. I actually wrote an article on this. Call it sex and violence, the two non-fungible measures of being a man. And really all it is is just you plop yourself down somewhere and you dare somebody to move you. Like, whatever that is. But that's up to you. And this kind of segues into what I mean by utility is greater than truth. Because I am annoyed. So annoyed when you see guys talking about, oh, this is the red pill philosophy. This is the red pill truth. And it's like, who gives a shit about truth? Like, and I'm not going to do the, what is truth? But it kind of is. What is it? And I want to say Whisper had a great, great definition. I mean, he said truth is predictability. And I'm like, fair enough. The idea is if you uh, see something objectively for what it is, you're able to predict it with more accuracy. And that there's some way that if you knew everything, every movement of every atom in the universe, you could basically predict the future forever. And I'm like... I get it. I get it. Let's let's walk it back to like human potential here. Human potential. Truth is like uh it's not findable. All truth is is belief. At least on like our little human brain scales, right? Cover all kinds of key shit. And you see this manifest in relationships cuz and back to my friend, the one that had the uh the Ellie, the chick there. I call it the Swiss watch problem. It's a lot of guys have this idea that they want truth. And if they get truth, they can make things predictable. And if they understand everything about women, like I can get inside of her head, I become omnipotent, and then I can make her love me like I like, like she should, as long as I do the right things. And it's, it's like a Swiss watch. If I just learn what every gear is, learn how to put it back properly, then I can tell the time for, for now and forever. And it's like, in theory, you could see that working, right? But... In practice, it does not. It does not work. It ends up being just a giant ego protection or projection. Like, just how many examples on social media of some like loveless loser trying to sort out his wife by or his wife or his girlfriend or that girl he's hot for by like I can I can fix her I can understand her. It's like, dude, you get some girl that's acting all damaged. Yeah, you know, where's uh what what did Rolo's? Hold on, let me pull up Rolo's channel. Some girl is damaged. Let's use something that's, like, relevant to the times. Rational male. I know for a fact he's got, like, his one of his latest videos is going to be him shitting on some Instagram thought. Let me see. Is it Lizzo? Is it... I finally learned who Lizzo is now that she's playing that flute. Uh, ignorant women explain the manosphere. Okay, so who is this chick he's bitching about? Anybody, did anybody watch that one? Oh, dude, pause that. Stop playing his video. Oh, Jesus Christ. He's got like 30 headers on this one. I don't know who the hell he's bitching about in this one. If it's anything to do with like the fresh and fit things, it's probably some ratchet chick with melanin or something. I don't know. All right, yeah, I give up. I give up. Just insert whatever Instagram model just got famous before. <laughs> um, 
Swiss watch. All right, let's go back to the back to the thing here. So they think if they can understand her, and that's why guys love to talk about women, and that's why everybody's field report is always about she, and they always describe the wife in great detail. Well, she did this. Or if they say something bad that happened in her life, they're like, yeah, she turned me down for sex. And then she did this because, and then the guy will always like ascribe motive. And this is really where you guys go wrong is where you start assuming you know what her motivations are. Like you won't, you don't. In fact, I can only, here's, I don't know much. Like as far as like, this is 100% true. I don't know much, but I do know this. There, whatever it is, you think she's thinking whatever you think her motivations are whatever you think her inspiration is to do what she did to wrong you so bad and require her belong into the streets and 304s and all that other shit whatever she did whatever she thought the one thing the one thing you can take as true is whatever you think it is is absolutely wrong it's all you have to say whatever you think it is is wrong okay yeah, fixing other people's problems is easier than fixing your own. And that's the funny thing. They're often the same problem. Like Green Knights here, like other people's problems are often because of your problems, especially in a relationship. If you're if you're in a relationship as a man, you generally are the or at least expected to be the dominant one, right? Like, you know, you're supposed to be in charge, she's supposed to submit, you're supposed to be dominant. She's more attracted to you when you're that way. You're more attracted to her when you're that way. It's been throughout history. It tends to work a lot better than those poly relationships where the dudes go on a murder spree. So whatever, just roll with it. The details are for you to sort out. But if you're in one of those relationships and your girl acts emotional and you respond in like weirdo shit ways, and then it kind of feeds into her irrationality. So she becomes more irrational and more irrational. And then, yeah, so you want to fix her problem, but that's not her problem. That's your problem, and she's a reflection of it. It's like, uh, girls are always the reflection of their men. Archwinger had a great post on that. The, how did he put it? Ow. Uh, your woman will act as shitty as you let her. And that's basically it. Like, if you're dating a girl, and she acts a damn fool, and you let her, like, what do you mean you let her? You, like, smack her? Like, no, no, I just mean, like, you put up with it. Like, how she acts, you can't change that. But how you react to it, you can. So if she starts weaponizing sex and you start doing what she wants, then you just encourage her to continue to weaponize sex. If she decides to weaponize sex and you decide not to play that game and you go do your own thing, then she's discouraged from uh, weaponizing sex. Of course, she might be discouraged from dating you too, but... That's the nature of relationships. There's a start date and there's an end date and there's fun in between and then there's pain at the end and it's just what they do. But the big thing about Red Pill isn't how to win that girl back. It's how to notice when these trends are happening and how to act appropriately. Is that true? Uh, maybe you can win her back, maybe, but this is about it's about the utility of it. Like what's useful here? I've seen way too many guys. Oh, she's a great thing for the book. I'm Still writing that one up, and it's probably a different newsletter, so we'll address it again in the other things, but it was the section on I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Perfect example. Look at that. Like, what's the truth in that statement? I love you, but I'm not in love with you. In other words, I'm happy, I'm comfortable, but I'm not sexually attracted, right? So as a guy, you hear that and like, okay. So if you look at that from like, okay, what's a red pill truth? Well, desire is this and desire is that, and so... You having fun, bro? <laughs> He's going to have a nap, I think, the rest of this stream. There you go. Um, looks at it as a true statement. Okay, so I have everything in place that I need except sexual desire. So I'm going to do the build a better mousetrap. Yes, thank you, Marty. It's definitely real because the pain of me losing it was real. <laughs> uh, and that's when guys are like, okay, I'm going to hit the gym and get hot for her. And then I'm going to learn game and, and run game on her for her. And then uh, Ryan said about manufactured outrage. I'm going to do manufactured outrage for her. And they're doing all these things trying to win her over. And it's funny because you see these same guys will laugh at single guys who are trying so hard to attract a woman that's clearly not into them. And then all of their all of their actions come across as pandering, right? Single guy, you're like, oh, you're an idiot. Just let her go. She's not into you, bro. But as soon as, for some reason, as soon as you put a ring on it, the rules don't apply anymore. It's like, no, you you can't do it for her. You have to do it 
to achieve a goal. I don't even want to say you do it for yourself, because that's like, that's like a shitty cop-out. Do it for yourself, bro. No, do it for yourself means you're doing it for her, but you're pretending you're not. You're doing it to achieve a certain outcome. Like, you're not trying to, to fuck your wife. You're trying to be more fuckable. You're not trying to get with that girl. You're trying to get with, uh, have the ability to get with more girls, you know? Yeah, I'm going to create a bunch of covert contracts. That'll get her hot. That's where truth gets you. Because truth is supposed to be, like, predictable. So if I do these things, this girl will like me. Never works. Never works. And the times that it does work, it, it isn't working. It's something else worked. And this just happened to coincide with it. It's a correlation. Which sucks because then guys start to equate that correlation with a causation and they continue to do those unattractive things. And then when the underlying attractive behavior goes away, I don't get it. This used to work all the time. Now it doesn't work. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you, man. Maybe, just maybe, you're wrong and maybe truth doesn't matter. It's always about utility. You guys have heard me say it like a hundred times the moon is made out of cheese. Like if I tell you the moon's made out of cheese and you go work out three days a week, then as far as the red pill is concerned, moon's made out of cheese. It's consequentialism, but I like to wrap it in like an eighth grade rednecky reading <laughs> reading level because I like when I make this stuff sound as stupid as possible because then it's good. It lets you know not to take it too seriously and definitely don't take it literally. Well, well actually, the moon is actually not made out of cheese. Shut up. And so it's never about truth. Like I can give you guys all kinds of statements. Is that true? Is, are all women really like that, guys? Do you think all women are like that without exception? It's like that's missing the point. It's not even that that statement is true or false. It's that you're missing the intent behind the statement. And I'm gonna use all kinds of red-pilled examples. All women are like that is similar to treat all guns as if they're loaded. Now you can sit here if you wanna be like an idiot, which most guys are. They're gonna sit here and argue whether guns are loaded, whether guns are not loaded, whether there's uh, there's easy ways to check weapons if they're safe, so you don't have to assume anything. You can just do this and do this, and they'll give you like a, a hyper technical manual on how to unload and make and clear a gun. Not realizing there's 500,000 types of like models of guns and they all have different procedures and different methods and different magazines and different ammunition and different safeties and you know what I mean? But then there's the other group that says, oh, there's just so much variety. You can't, you can't possibly know how to unload every gun. So just continue walking around, putting them in your mouth and hoping for the best. And it's like, dude. Instead, take the statement and look at it from a utility standpoint and not a truth standpoint. What happens when you tell a guy all guns are loaded? Well, generally speaking, the guy doesn't point it at anything and he doesn't want to die. Generally speaking, he's more careful with it. Generally speaking, he doesn't, you know, look down the barrel. He makes it a habit to check the gun, make sure it's clear to unload it every time he uses it. He ends up making better choices. And that is exactly what we're trying to say here with all of these red pill mental models. When you're talking about hypergamy, when you're talking about AWALT, when you're talking about the Iron Rules of Tomasi, when you're talking about the 16 Commandments of Poon, when you're talking about the 48 Laws of Power, when you're talking about anything... I use say I say training wheels as opposed to basic training because there's a lot less yelling going on. But yeah, go with whatever metaphor works for you. Yeah, are women all really like that? And then you get the the correlating one. Like not all women are like that. So you have a Walt and a Walt. Which one is true? Well, neither one's true. But which one of them will help you make better choices? If you assume all women are hypergamous, they could be hyper loyal to one person at a time, and if it's not you, it's somebody else. You assume women want to date their betters, not their equals. You uh, assume when she's into you, she finds men less attractive, other men less attractive. You assume when she wants a girl's night out, that's a way of making herself sexually available. Like all these things, you start assuming all of these AWALT characteristics, and then you make better choices from it. That's all that matters. I don't really care. Not all women are like that. Yeah, I get it. Not all women do all of this stuff to the same degree at the same time for the same reasons. But... If you keep them in the back of your mind, as you go through your little life plodding along with, you know, Susie or Stacy or or Catherine or Susan or or uh, uh, Sam, <laughs> I don't know. I don't judge. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. And you keep this stuff in the back of your mind, you tend to make better choices. So that's the whole point. It's the whole point. And if you can handle that, it also has a secondary benefit. It's that you start to understand the concept of subtext. Subtext, plausible deniability, all these things, right? 
So if you can listen to a statement that somebody, some red pill guy tells you, you know, hey, all bitches belong to the streets. I mean, do they actually belong on the streets? It's like, no, but that's your way of just thinking of her as like, ah, she's just a whore and I'll leave her be. Now, I would argue that that one is not a good mental model because it reinforces the Madonna whore uh, paradigm. The idea that women are either virginal Madonna good girls or whorish bad girls. And then they're like, never shall the two meet when that's, it doesn't work because then either you get into a relationship with a girl and you automatically, all the slut shaming stuff comes in, all the sexual frustration stuff comes in. You're basically training your woman to not love and enjoy sex with you. Or you go the other route where you can't possibly get together with a woman because they're all just hoes and they'll steal half your income and shit like that. That's where that shit leads. That's why I don't like like the, the she belongs to the street statement. In fairness, if she's not invested in you, she belongs to the streets is really the only you know, like useful part of that statement. Doesn't matter if she has tattoos. Doesn't matter if she has colored hair. Dude, my girl has tattoos. Where I was where I was running my pickup, everybody had tattoos. So like, looking for a girl that had no tattoos, you're like, why? It's, it's, you're not gonna find one. They just don't exist. So it's not even really a metric. And it's not like women who want to sleep around wear like a uniform or like a special tag or something like that or. You know, you can hit a tricorder on them. Like, nothing like that. They dress, they look exactly the same. In fact, the example in my book, Chapter 2, Heels Over Head for Rose, which I reference way too much. But that girl, white t-shirt, blue jeans. Blonde hair, no tattoos. Looked like girl next door. Well, at least I don't think there was. No, there was a tattoo. There was a rose on the hip, but you couldn't tell that at first. Absolutely. Like, at a first glance, you would admit any of A.J. Cortez's aposemitic, you know, colored poisonous frogs thing. So, it's like, you can keep looking for these traits, but they're not going to mean shit. They're not. They exist in the Oedipus Day. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should leave all my doors unlocked because not all people are thieves. You're getting it, right? But here's the thing, and this is why there's such a... Yeah, it, it, it's, if I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but it's the idea that brightly colored things in nature are doing that as a warning. Like, if you try to eat me, you're going to die because I'm poisonous as fuck. Or aposomatic. Actually, that make, make, makes more sense than aposemetic. Make it sound like, yeah, that's, <laughs> the frogs in nature have yamakas and they're poisonous. <laughs> but you see what I mean? And this is, this is the point of all this red pill stuff. It's not telling you what to think. It's telling you how to think. Now, what you do with this, it's up to you. Whatever you want. One of you, some of you guys want to just play the field. Maybe you're in your 20s and you're like, I just want to get laid. I don't want a wife. And I'd argue that's probably a better way of going about it, but that's not my place to judge or have a, or like interest in it. It's your life. You live it how you want. Maybe some guys are in their, their 30s or their 40s and you're like, yeah, dude, I want to... What shape is alpha? I don't know. What shape doesn't exist? One of those ones that's like a negative one size circle. Because alpha isn't a thing. Doesn't exist. Never existed. Not even as a mental model. It's just a marketing term to sell you guys more soap. Uh, where was I going with this? Oh yeah, the decision. So yeah, it's what do you want. So if you just want to, you know, play the field, bang around, or be like Troy, and you're like, I don't know, how old was he? Like 47 or something like that? And he just wants to run pickup and have fun until he dies? I'm like... Fill your boots, man. So yeah, acting like with a uh, well, aposemitic girls and all the, the colored hair. Like, no, he doesn't care about that. All he's looking for is initial sexual investment. That's it. And so that's what he looks for. All women are like that. Okay. That works for him. All women are like that. Looks for the sexual cues. Looks for the interest. Looks for the DTF. Or D. Yeah, DTF. Down to smash. And he's happy. Maybe you're the guy, though. You hit like 38 and you want like ah oh, man i wouldn't mind a girlfriend settle down and you've been dating a bunch of girls and this one has always been after you and you're like dude i've been like plating her for like a year and she's never done anything like to piss me off she's never pushed any boundaries she's actually been great if anything i kind of feel bad for how i treat her and you're like you know what she comes in there one day crying with like the where are we speech i want to settle down and you're like you know what fuck it let's try it sure Raver, I see your super chat. I'll get to it in just a second because that's actually a really good question. But that's the point. So then, but then, a wall. Do you understand that too? You're looking for investment. If you start getting signs that she's not invested, then you know, 
you may not be the hypergamous best option and this relationship is probably on the outs. But if you're getting investment, well, she has tattoos and colored hair. But, dude, she wakes up every morning watching me wake up. She makes breakfast. She cooks all the time. If she's ever out past nine, she always gives me a call and lets me know when she's coming back. She's never, she never does anything to make me suspect that there's possibly something happening on the side. Now, it doesn't mean that nothing is happening, but I find most people aren't that smart. Like if they want to get a side piece on you, they don't hide it, especially women, because women start to feel better. So they start to talk more about the other guy. That's when all of a sudden you hear like constant stories about the new guy at work. And then she has to stay up late and all these excuses. And as long as you got your head on straight, you can notice this shit. But that's the point. AWALT isn't true or false. It's a utility statement. And all these things, if you don't take them as utility statements, you're wasting your time. Now, where's my time on this so far? Actually, yeah, we're about time to move on. Let me add one more bozo talking smack, and then we'll get to this. I love the way girls smell. I love how you know, they always make sure, by and large, they- Oh, did I lose the thing? Damn it all the hell. There we go, we're back. I don't know what it is. Keep getting these sunspots. Uh, frame. So I'm going to start off the discussion on what frame is with a super chat from Braver Leech. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate the super chat. If you guys have questions, feel free to throw those out there and I'll interrupt things for you. So what is frame? Why would I want to have one? And if I could be a loser and have frame, why does it matter? It's a good question. First off, we'll deal with them in order. The what is frame? Hard, hard thing to describe easy thing to understand once you have it think of and uh i've already had those examples before but the way i've kind of worked it into my work is frame is your worldview frame is how you process the things that happen to you how you react to what's going on in the outside world based on you know a combination of your ethics your values your your experience and mental models. I think that's the important one is the mental models. Mental models are a story, a narrative structure you have in your head that allow you to shortcut your decisions. Christians should automatically know this. If you've ever heard the, same, the, the term, what would Jesus do? Uh, I hear he's on bail right now. <laughs> but if you've ever heard like, what would Jesus do? That's a mental model because whatever it is you're doing, uh, what would Jesus do? And then you do what you think he would do. That's how you shortcut it. And there's there's a psychological or evolutionary psych reason for it. It's because brains take like a quarter of the energy. Yeah, I saw that. It's It should be back now. I didn't skip anything. I just mumbled for a bit and waited for it to kick back in. Um, oh, where was I going? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, frame. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, I really lost my train of thought. God damn it, Alex. <laughs> By and large. Oh, oh, uh, uh, the, the purpose of frame. Yeah, so you have your own experiences, your own mental models you use, and the Christianity one is a great example. Your brain takes about a quarter of the energy that your body requires in a day, like for calories. Your muscles require some to stay muscular. Your uh, body requires it to keep the kidneys functioning and the heart pumping. And your brain requires about a quarter of all the calories you need in a day just to keep your thinking going. So it's a very, exp it's probably the most expensive organ in the body by a long shot. And so evolutionary wise, that's an expensive statement. Kind of the same as like warm blooded versus cold blooded animals. Cold blooded animals, very efficient. Hot blooded animals or warm blooded, not so much. So they have to eat more. They require more calories. Now there was a selective pressure for this because, you know, there's food isn't always abundant. And so what, and I don't know at what point in the evolutionary chain, which kingdom kind of developed this, but just assume it's people in caveman age because this makes it easier. As a utility statement, it's not true. Uh, people who were better able to use their brain more efficiently were better able to, oops, buttons undone, were better able to survive and thrive. They had more energy for making cave babies, right? And so humans developed the power of language, which is something I think it's unique to us. And that allowed us to have these narrative structures and these narrative structures allowed us to be more efficient with our calories, which allowed us to have more cave babies. Yeah, awesome. Now, brains have a thing called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is our ability to create new neural connections, essentially to learn. That's why you can't teach an old dog for new tricks. 
So to save energy, your brain decides once you got your models in place and you're living good enough, it locks them in, removes your neuroplasticity. You don't learn anything new. This is why people are stubborn. This is why talking about politics never changes minds or anything. Nobody will change their mind about religion, about politics, or about their wife unless a fight or flight threat elicits a fight or flight response like that kind of thing. Because your brain's like, you know what? It's like 70% good enough as a solution. And that is going to be more efficient for me than to every six months reevaluate and change all my mental models. So let's just go with it. It's not the best, but it's good enough. You know, your brain works on good enough. And that's why zeroing out is a thing. And this is, I know your question was about frame and I'm getting to there. Is it, give it a restart. It had one small hiccup about 10 minutes ago, but it should be fine now. Uh, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so you have this efficiency thing and your brain understands that good enough is good enough until you hit a uh, zero, like a zeroing out. That's a great example. Zeroed out is the idea that it's not just that your wife leaves you and takes the kids and moves out of state. It's that your entire set of mental models has been proven wrong to the point that your body treats it as a life or death thing. That's why the highest suicide rate is divorced men between 40 and 60 years old. So it's not that they lost the wife and the kids. It's that they lost their worldview. They lost their frame. The idea of the white picket fence, the happy wife, happy life, all that shit is gone, right? So making... A new set of mental models is difficult, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of focus, but that anger that you receive during that time of being zeroed out is the best time to do it because your anger increases your neuroplasticity. Again, so this is where frame comes in. So as you develop new sets of mental models, a collection of what I would call them a deep narrative. Ideologies are, are deep narratives, like Christianity is a deep narrative. Being like the typical champagne socialist is a deep narrative. Collection of mental models. And then as you build your own mental models, you start to have your own way of processing things on the earth. And this is what the purpose of the red pill is that a lot of guys just get together at various points in their life. You know, I'm single and lonely. I'm in a relationship, but struggling. I'm in a marriage. My wife doesn't want a kid and I do, or I'm in a marriage and we're losing it in a dead bedroom or all these different pain points in a guy's life. And all these guys get zeroed out. And all these guys start talking to each other and working through the problems, figuring out how to solve it. A collection of mental models came out of it. If anything, and it's a praxeology. It's like auto mechanics, right? It's not that we're deciding what car is the best car. We're telling you guys how to change spark plugs. And so frame is the manifestation of all of these narrative structures and all of your anchored decisions. Does that make sense? I know it's a bit like convoluted and, and like, uh, like intellectual, like Stefan Molyneux bullshit, but yeah. And it's true. You look at anybody, like I can pick anybody in this chat that I know from their life, like Mish. Mish is living his life. He's got his own set of mental models. He doesn't have all of the red pill mental models, but he has the ones that work for him and they work for him. He has to make hard choices, but then there's good outcomes from it because he knows what he's trying to achieve. And when he makes his choices, they're always choices that push him closer to that goal, right? Now, don't get me wrong. If feminism and all of their mental models got you there, most red pill guys would be perfectly happy to say, dude, uh, whatever the fuck feminism says, do that shit. Make the women strong and independent. They'd love it. If the Tradcon ones were, like with the white picket fence, and if just doing more work and having a stay-at-home wife made life worth living, then absolutely. Tomorrow, you'd see Vaz or Whisper or Rolo being like, dude, the thing you gotta do is you gotta get a promotion and stop your wife from working because then your life will be happy. And like, fuck, I'd be awesome. But that's the problem. Every one of these institutions that delivers how like the how you should live your life these mental models these collections of mental models these deep narratives they've all failed yeah well it's a collection of mental models but i i mean that's it's not the right resolution for the answer that in the way you asked it essentially then and this is where it ties into what is frame so you have these mental models and you make decisions it turns out that anything that is outside of this this deep narrative of yours is like amusing intriguing or funny it's never taken seriously Case in point, a guy without frame, he's in a marriage, he's talking, his wife's starting to have a freak out moment because of something, whatever, arguing that the dishes aren't done. So the guy starts to get irritated because she's mad and he says like, the dishes are done. I'm looking at them right now. And she's like, they're not done. And then they start yelling and fighting and whatever. He has no frame. She has frame. 
yeah, yeah, the dishes are done, but emotionally she thinks they're not done. And so she's trying to establish her frame that the dishes aren't done. His frame is that I'm looking, the dishes are done, and he's arguing with her over that. Now, who wins this frame? That while well, she started with yelling and screaming, he started calm and stoic. The yelling and screaming took over, therefore the yelling and screaming frame is a thing that establishes frame. Everybody has their own separate collections of mental models. And when you put those against each other, one of them will come out establishing the group narrative, you know? And this is where a lot of guys talk about, oh, she whittled my frame down. No, she had a stronger frame and yours buckled. That's it. Uh, actually, yeah, if one of you guys want to check on the Robert one, I don't think so. I don't recall a Wayne Smith one. This is a DC saving throw for crying out loud. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mike. It's very nice of you, sir. So yeah, it's about who has the stronger frame, and that's the point. Like, if you have frame... You need to have it with like 100% certainty that it's something working for you. It can change over time, but it has to be one that's working for you. Now, you could just as easily argue that it could be completely, and this is where it gets to the third part of your question. If I could be a loser and have frame, why does it matter? It's not just having a frame matters. You need to have good frame, useful frame. Remember that Peterson thing about his complaint that words can mean anything and you know, talking is violence. He goes, look, you can make anything mean anything. And there's a hundred different interpretations of something, but there's only two that are any good. So while everything is subjective, there's only two things that are subjective and useful. And so that's generally what people go with. And yes, I absolutely agree with that hundred percent. So yeah, you're right. You can be an incel sitting at home with your sex doll, doing nothing but ranting about how Rolo's a fraud on YouTube. Give her. You can have a uninterruptible frame. In fact, I just had the, oh wait, here's this. Oh, you know what? I'll put it out later. But like the Anthony Johnson freakouts over Rolo Tomato. That's exactly a perfect example of strong and useless frame. So here's the thing. So you have to make your frame adapt to your situation. There's not a singular definition of frame. So for example, in your, if I could be a loser and have frame, why does it matter? First off, I don't know what you mean by loser. I'm going to assume you mean sexually unsuccessful and socially inept. So your frame is... Either they don't understand, that's the only two ways out of that. They don't understand me, I'm actually a secret king, blah, blah, blah. And you can own that 100%, but it doesn't make your life any better, even if it is strong frame. On the other hand, you could be, I have these serious deficiencies in my life, and I need to work on them. The idea is that I'm building them up, and that is your frame at that moment. I'm bad, but I'm getting better. Or I'm, I'm not bad, I'm uh, subpar, but getting better. And so when people shit on you for, you know, oh, you're a fat guy, you're like, I know it. Don't give it six months. Don't worry about it. You see what I mean? There's like a confidence in the process. And then as you get better, you get into good shape. You start learning how to talk to people, have social situations that you can navigate pretty well. That frame doesn't work for you anymore. Like how many times have you seen a fat guy lose a bunch of weight, but he still acts unattractive. He acts like the fat guy that needs everybody to like him and has to be the funny guy. And he stops realizing Stops and doesn't think to himself, hey, I'm actually the attractive guy now. I just have to sit there and be be Chad and life goes great, you know? So your frame is going to change over time. And in this case, yeah, a loser with frame, as long as that frame is getting you to a place where you're more successful in the things that matter to you. Now, what are they? It's up to you. If you want to be the loser that has the frame and the sex doll and all that shit, and you're perfectly comfortable owning that, give her. Give her. No fault to you. But don't complain then. When things don't go right for you in the ways that matter. This is why I always shit on MGTOWs. It's not because I think men shouldn't go their own way. It's not because I don't think men going their own way is a sincere and decent reaction to what's going on now. It's not that. It's that if you're going your own way, fucking go. I don't want to hear whammon ain't shit 500 times a year from MGTOW 42069. Well, meanwhile, they're talking about how happy they are going their own way. That's just a cope. That's not frame. That's why I'm like probably the only guy amongst the red pill guys who like doesn't have a bad thing to say about the guy turd flinging monkey. Like I don't care about like the wheat wall, all those goofy balls. I never watch any of their stuff, but TFM. Cause yeah, I get it. His life, not one I'd pick for myself. I'm pretty sure he's not in, ex in stellar shape. Probably a little weird. Has a sex doll. His sex doll is an Instagram page. Instagram's bigger than mine. I got a sex doll out there that's better than me on Instagram, which I don't know how to take that. <laughs> I don't. 
Is that a compliment or an insult or what? But he's aware of what it is. He knows what he's doing. He's made the decision. And he's living with the consequences. So I'm like, can't fault a guy for that. Just because I don't like it, whatever. But I would argue he does have frame. Fine. So why would you want to have one? Well, everybody has a frame, and that's the other thing. Everybody has frame. You just don't you just don't think of it, or it's just a weak frame. So whether you want one or not, you could be the most codependent, validation-seeking guy ever, and that's your frame. I need everybody else to like me. And then everything you do is catered around that singer fo singular focal point. So yeah, everybody's manipulating you. Everybody takes you for granted. Everybody treats you like crap. But you still have a frame. It's just your frame is suboptimal. It's not useful. Nobody has no frame. It's like game. How Rolo's like, everybody has everybody has game. It's just some of them don't work. It's the same thing with frame. So when we talk about frame, I guess the, the to not make it shorthand, it's a useful, a useful and a strong frame, you know? Can't buy it off a of Gumroad course. Well, give me some time. I will make it Gumroad ready, sir. Maybe I'll go... Actually, I have to go with Teachable because I've been shitting on Gumroad for so long <laughs> that... <laughs> I'm just screwed if I ever do a Gumroad course. Anyway, so the frame description that came through Married Red Pill after like a year of like thousands of guys focusing on it was the tetrahedron. The idea is it's like a, it's a, it's a pyramid, like a 3D pyramid, it's basically like the pyramids of Giza. And so there's three points on the bottom and one point on top. The points on the bottom are intellectual, physical, and emotional. And then the top is vision. The idea is you can't have a vision unless you have the base set up. So you need to have your emotional stuff right. You need to have your physical stuff right. And you need to have your intellectual stuff right. Now, the intellectual stuff is what we've been talking about so far. All these mental models, all of these ways of looking at the world, understanding, you know, if you're being manipulated, if you're not being manipulated, what's the purpose of statistics? Why do people defer to an authority? Do you trust the authority? All the smart guy stuff that makes you act better. Great. Awesome. Everybody loves to focus on that because you can sound really smart when you talk about it. Physical, it's fairly obvious. You know, being in good shape, being physically attractive, that should be, it should be self-evident. Learning how to dress with style, learning how to um, have good hygiene, have nice hair, to have a mane, not a mullet, you know, shit like that. That's important too, because you can't judge a book by its cover, but people sure as well, sure as hell try. So why wouldn't you? Dude, if you're the... I'm using the book as an example. If you're the best book ever, and you put a shitty cover on top, nobody's going to read it. And you could say that's not right, and we shouldn't do that, but it is, and it's there. The third one, and this is the one I have liked to focus on, because it's the one that's severely under underrepresented in like the red pill in general. It's the emotional. And he's like, guys, in the motions, that's some chick shit. It's like, no. It's kind of... Like, think of mental health. Think of uh, anything psychological. Think of, you know, I want you to feel more, you know, all that shit. It matters. Guys, ha it turns out guys have feelings. We may not be able to cry in front of our women, but that doesn't mean we don't have feelings. Anger is a feeling. Anger is a social emotion. Rage is a feeling. It's a limbic feeling. Uh, validations, emotional. PTSD, emotional. All this stuff is emotional. And so the entire field of mental health has been designed to help women cope better with their emotions and because they consider men and women to be a blank slate you get the same thing that's why for any of you who have ever been to a shrink's office you always probably are more irritated than anything like i know the military issued me one after my deployment and i was like so annoyed uh love your article i can't even you should blog more well thank you bezo fear thank you for the super chat i mean i want to blog more but i can only do so much writing in a day so at this point it's book two is getting all the work once once book two is done and I have the spare time, I'll probably add some blogs now and again, so don't worry. It'll be there. Uh, but thank you, I appreciate it. I Can't Even was the, the article, by the way, about telling better stories. And the idea that a lot of your charm and a lot of your ability to hold a conversation is about your talent in telling stories and making them emotionally engaging. And don't get me wrong, if I'm able to do that better on YouTube, it should get me you know, more, more subscribers, better channel, that kind of shit. How's book two going? Fun fact on this one. Okay, small digression, and then we're getting back to it. So the book clocked in at about 110,000 words, which is 
big. Like 120, like 60,000 is the minimum for a proper book size. At 120, you kind of should split it up into two. So I had to do something like major cuts. Luckily, my computer gave me a blue screen of death one morning out of nowhere. My backups didn't update and I lost it. And I was like, oh, the book is gone. That's not good. Luckily, from like the email list and a bunch of other sources and older backups, I've managed to put about half of it back together. And I had just finished the first round of editing. So I was going to do the second round of editing where I just read it through start to finish. And so now what I have to do is like rewrite the sections that are missing. So it put me a little ways, probably a couple weeks behind now, but ideally I want it out for Christmas. Uh, lesson learned. You have, if you have one backup, you have no backups. If you have two backups, you have one backup. If you don't test your backups, then you have no backups. So, but the beauty of it is I've read the thing five times already. So I kind of remember what I'm supposed to write anyway. So that's good. It's better anyway. Like I shouldn't have to have the book that large. I should be able to cut down a lot of stuff. And so it should be streamlined a little bit better. Why not just use a Git repo? Nerdy as hell, but lets you push to remote and be private. Well, I have a system already. It's fine. It's just Google Drive and then the Scrivener backups. But I've just added those and then another update. But here's technical stuff. Don't worry about it. Just wanted to thank Bezo. Anyways, back to back to the psychological part of frame. So yeah, you essentially have to become your own experts. So if you want, you know, the physical part of frame, then yeah, you have to learn how to be your own coach. Yeah, you can hire like Drew Bay if you want to, to have him train you, hire Jack, have him show you stuff. But at some point, you have to walk away from the teacher and do your own thing. So you have to be your own fitness guy. Intellectual, you have to be your own teacher. Yeah, you can learn from other people, but ultimately it's going to be on your own to learn how to learn. And this psychological stuff, that's how to be your own priest. That's how to be your own psychologist. That's how to be your own shrink. You get that stuff? Yeah, you can get a shrink to talk to you about this stuff, but this is the one place I find that like there is a real lack of, uh, of guidance, of help of institutional assistance on these kind of things. So you kind of just have to do it yourself. And yeah, part of it, part of a little, big part of the red pill is realizing that I've essentially gotten myself my own shrink, shrink degree, same as Rolo. Evo site guys like Jeff Miller can't stand him, but he's like, you went to school for eight years. I'm just some metal guy who got a bachelor's in it and learned it, learned the useful stuff as I went. And we're both in the same spot right now, except for I'm earning more money. So who's the idiot here? So once you get these things all together, you end up with uh, the pillars of frame are set up. And then vision is the part part of it that goes after. And everybody loves to have a vision, but nobody wants to do the work to earn it. Because like vision, if you just have it standing on physical, like if you just looks max and you just have physicality, it's just like a pillar. It's just going to fall over. If you have just looks and just intellectual stuff, then again, it's just two points with a pyramid. It's going to fall over. You need all three in place to kind of make it stable. And then you can have a vision. And a vision is nothing nobody can give it to you it's where you see your life maybe not in like specifics like in five years i want this this and this but like case in point my first vision post red pill was to never put myself in a position to be taken for granted or taken advantage of it's guided a lot of my decisions since then and it does really well like that's why for the most part i've avoided and all this like little youtube drama that's happened in the manosphere i've avoided all of the idiots I was the only guy who quit Anthony Johnson's gimmick and wasn't fired and then attacked. He hates me for it. <laughs> I don't mind. It's kind of funny. So yeah, frame. Anywho. Oh, wait. Yeah, here. Boom. What's up, fam? Got some big news to share that unfortunately is not so good. So I'm going to jump right into it. You're going to watch this video and you're going to cry. At least we can laugh at your ass as you cry like in, in the corner like a little f***ing girl in the fetal position. Lose that one. Now, I was thinking of archetypes, but I might go with passive and active dread. Dread itself. Yeah, I know, let's do dread. Whatever. Talk about dread a lot, but eh, fuck it. We got another hour to kill, you know? Uh, when thinking frame, I think of the song Pepper from the Butthole Sur. I didn't know anybody else listened to the Butthole Surfers. Jesus. Uh, electric, Larry Land album, one line in particular. You never know just how you look in other people's eyes. Well, yeah, if you want to go intellectual about it, there's the four... Um, elements of identity, like id, super ego, ego, whatever. Uh, how do they explain it? It's it's what you think of yourself, what others think of you, 
what you think others think of you and what others think you think of yourself. And those four things make your identity, which is fine, whatever. At that point, it gets a little too intellectual for me and I don't really care. Uh, P. McPherson, thank you for the save, sir. $4.99 super chat. A few weeks back, you mentioned a concentration cocktail to help you write. What was that again? Oh, well, I mean, there's a few things. Like, I was think I was talking about that on Patreon, actually. Which, by the way, the Patreon, I'm going to have to up the rates again because it's filled up a little bit too fast. And now we're back to, like, ideally, I want to have, like, two hours of, Q of like, uh, field reports and Q&As a week. And then every time it gets up to about three hours, I, I increase the prices to, like, slow down the slow down the, the membership. So just be aware. If you were ever on the fence, it's probably best to join now because once I get around to it, I'm going to be doing that. So the cocktail, yeah. If you guys notice this, too, it's everything. Everybody bitches about ADD and... ADHD and OCD and I'm just like it's all bullshit look it's just there's too many distractions that's it it's too easy to be distracted oh yeah Mish you haven't heard of them butthole surfers look them up they're a band you might like them and Primus anyway uh yeah and so Rolo swore by this thing called Modanophil and it's like nootropics right the idea is it helps keep you focused on it. I mean, there's SSRIs like Ritalin and that. The problem is with SSRIs is they're absolute cancer. Like, they mute your sex drive. They mute your emotions. You don't really get focus. You just, if anything, you kind of lose your ability to focus. It's, like, really shitty, but a lot of students love it. Um, the race towns were originally developed in the 50s as anti-epileptics. But I like it. It's just kind of like, it's just one of those things that make it easier for you to, you know, tune out distractions. And so it'd be a five milligram pure race tam, which is the oldest and safest one. Like there's a whole bunch of variations, but I don't know. Whatever. I don't, I, once I got something that works, I just stick with it. And that one works really well. That allows you to kind of sit there and write for like a solid eight hours, which if you haven't done that like natural, it's fucking impossible. Like your brain just can't handle it. I don't know how else to say it. You'll notice this as you write after like the third natty hour, you just like you're staring at the same sentence and just like your productivity drops off a cliff. So this is one of those things that kind of help you build that up. At the same time, when I was on a, a cut a month or two ago, I was just like, oh, I haven't done an ECA stack in forever. If you guys don't know, that's ephedrine, caffeine and aspirin, which is um, 200 micrograms or milligrams of caffeine or one caffeine pill. Then one, uh, I think it's 400 milligram aspirin pill and 24 milligrams of ephedrine. You can use the bile of vitamin 25 milligram tablets, but since some people got some heart attacks, they're like, yeah, no. So now you have to buy them in eight milligram uh, nasal decongestant tabs. So you have to take three of those. You take that first thing in the day, and then halfway through the day, you take another aspirin and another three ephedrine. Now, if you have any heart condition, I would strongly suggest you don't. Because I remember this. When I first took it, I was in the military. And oh, that was stupid. That was so stupid. Um, no sleep. Working 16-hour days. Our uh, mess was set up like an ice box. I was so hot because it like ups your body temperature as well as like your uh, adrenaline. And what ended up happening? I could feel my heartbeat. And I was like, this is not good. And so I stopped. I'm like, no. That and the fact that our, our mess was set up to be like 10 degrees above zero. Or for you guys, like negative 20 or negative 10, something like that. And I was sweating. <laughs> like, that's not good. Helps for a cut, but yeah. Now, for both of these ones, I do want to say I'm not one of those idiots that's like takes it every day, all day. It's first activities. Give it a go first part of the day. If it's one of those slog days where it's just not happening, then I would take those. But that's it. Yeah. Yeah. But to be fair, like the cutting thing was like, yeah, I just kind of like the focus part of it. So that helps you if you're doing if you're doing a crunch time, but you don't want to take them long term either. Right. Like this is not medical advice, but I found if you're taking those uh, race tams for longer than like, let's say a week, it develops like brain fog. When even when you get off them, it's kind of like, oh, you got a little fogginess to you and it's not quite there. It goes away after a while. But if you just lay off. And don't take them often, then you don't have to worry about those side effects. Same as ECA. I don't know what the effects are of taking them long term, but I'm like, eh, whatever. Yeah, thanks for interrupting Dead to Address. Well, it's fine. Like I said, at the end of this, it is here to entertain you guys. And if these are the topics you wanted me to add in here. Uh, I'm sure 
yeah, Pedalite might work too. But I, I, like I said, a lot of people always recommend, oh, you got to try this, try this. I'm like, dude, I got something that works. I know the risks involved. I'm not about to go researching. If it's not broke, I'm not going to fix it. All right, so we're going to do that. Well, I'll make that its own section for new tropics. I hate getting into the topic, to be honest, because so many people are like religiously zealous about it. And they have to build stacks and they have to min-max their stacks. I'm like, I I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get some work done, man. I don't got time for this shit. Uh, the cutting, the trick is never cut or bulk, but for that I have my services. Yeah, I know what Jack's talking about, like the, the just eat clean all year, and then just eat more and then eat less, but always eat clean. I should specify when I'm saying that, like cutting or bulking, it's not that I'm eating unhealthy or healthier. It's just the amount of calories I get in a day and then something else I'll take. So not even clean. All right, fair enough. That's up to Jack. He'll sell that. He'll pitch that one for you. Anyways, what are we talking about now? We're talking about Dread. Dread is another one of those things, just like Frame. It had like a solid year where everybody like couldn't shut the fuck up about it. And, uh, but nobody was able to define it. That was the other thing. Made me laugh. Everybody knows what Dread is. Everybody's talking about Dread. But you ask a guy what Dread is, he's like, I don't know. It's a way to win back. And that was like even the Blue Pill Professor when he tried writing a book on Dread. We tried writing a book on Dread. How did he phrase it? How to, how to, how to fix uh, a sexless marriage. How to win back your wife. And I was just like, eh. Just a covert contract. Like, everybody's known this since the old pickup days in the 2000s. Like, you can't use pickup to win that girl. You can just use it to get more girls. And it's just because you put a ring on it doesn't change things or relationship. That's why I always laugh at the MGTOW guys going, juice isn't worth the squeeze. Why are you putting all this effort in? And it's like, you're going to put this effort in regardless, unless you want to be alone and lonely. So at least right now you got a sparring partner beside you that actually has fucked you in the past. So just work with it, man. What hell happened to Megatron's message? <laughs> the fucking way things. So Dread isn't about winning your wife back. It's not about... And then a lot of guys have this stupid revenge fantasy shit, which I get the appeal to it. If you're in the anger phase, the idea of you're going to teach that bitch wife of yours a lesson for not sleeping with you. Sure, I get it. It's probably very good to resonate. In fact, that's why I still use the word Dread. I'm sure I could come up with like a better, more accurate term. But you got to remember, the kind of guy who's even thinking about Dread is the guy who's in a loveless dead bedroom a sexless marriage a sexless relationship and then telling him hey do you want to teach that bitch a lesson i guarantee you he's more inter oh really yeah actually i would thank you very much so yeah you're gonna you're gonna bait and switch him on that one but i mean he gets what he wants in the end so it's, it'll be fine he'll be fine but that's how a lot of guys who don't understand it and that's why you see like the 33 secrets and the the myron and anybody who's read three rational male articles and think they're red pilled that's why they always say dread is about build anxiety make that bitch worry and be afraid of losing you it's like power fantasy shit you're like yeah it's awesome lino gets the sword and fucking thundercat ho in reality it's not really i kind of take the approach same as like i talked before about jack where it's after after you've been through the ringer you've come out the other side you've made yourself attractive you've made yourself less unattractive you've established your boundaries you're not letting yourself be taken for granted anymore. Maybe you have a main event. Maybe there is a lot of anxiety. Maybe your wife just checked out and moved on. Doesn't really matter. The point is you have taught yourself some valuable skills. You've learned how not to be taken for granted, how to establish your boundaries, and how to get what you want in a relationship, right? Maybe not with her, but with somebody. Like, I don't know. Yeah, maybe those are some thirsty cats. He had me at Thundercats. Yeah, I always got to make the good references. How those guys haven't made a comeback, I'll never know. Like, they should be way better than He-Man and G.I. Joe right now. But I don't know, whatever. Those are some thirsty cats. <laughs> Back in the day when their clever way of naming things was throw an O or a Tron at the end of it. <laughs> Megatron. Lion O. Panthro. <laughs> Cheetara. <laughs> yeah. And I kind of like, and that's how that's how he put it. So both and both are correct, but which one's more useful as a definition, right? Remember utility versus truth. I think 
the better one ultimately is the um dread is the opposite of being taken for granted i like that one because it fits yeah you're gonna have you're gonna build anxiety in your girl because desire comes at the tail end of anxiety so if she's not anxious at all about losing you or anxious about making you happy then yeah you're not getting laid so well that makes her feel bad well you know is it really that bad everybody seems to be happy when it happens so maybe it's just she's addicted to the the feeling anxiety maybe it's not altogether a bad emotion to have it's like being angry as a man is is being angry that bad yes it's horrible well a lot of guys got a lot of good stuff done when they were angry I'm not saying you need to go to a school or rent a van I'm just saying you didn't like thunderbirds jack dude i don't know if i can have you as a mod anymore in this channel and the good part about dread too is that a lot of guys they like oh, i've been dating a girl for three months i'm gonna start using dread it's like no man there's no need for dread if you can walk away without any consequence that's why that's why guys who are single guys who are in relationships guys who are dating you don't need dread you don't need it at all because just your ability to walk away is the dread the whole purpose of dread is what do i do now that i have a mortgage and three kids and a wife and a legal contract like i have all this stuff in place so i can't just get up and like going for some smokes see you later and then come like leave for 20 years so what do you do now when your ability to just walk away and say fuck it doesn't exist and that was where the that's what dread had come to address that that specific thing and it's where i talk often about luxury branding because right now i mean masculinity is really it really is it's cheap just four billion dudes on earth four billion dudes we're all generally the same yeah i can earn a living yeah i can support a wife but i mean a wife can get an office job and support herself she doesn't need you and if she can't there's a government program to help her out so all those things that used to be like you needed a man for that you couldn't have income without a man you couldn't own property without a man all these things that made men valuable in women's eyes are all gone they're all gone she can do them herself she can do them better or they've been automated to the point that nobody even needs to do them at all so what do you do well what is it else what else is there that women are attracted to other than provision it turns out what they're attracted to is like sexual desire and emotional comfort so yeah well, lean in on that if you're going to learn the opposite of being taken in for granted have something that's valuable and assign worth to it right that's dread so if you're valuable like if other girls want you then a girl you're with is more likely to want you because you know competitive creatures that's how women handle jealousy oh you want my man i don't think so hey your husband's nice i'm gonna i'm gonna blow him that'll teach you a lesson women have sex for all kinds of reasons turns out horny's very low on the list but so as a man, you kind of realize like all these commodity things you offer, your ability to earn a paycheck, your I'm a good father. Like, yeah, I'm sure you're a good father. But after the divorce, she found a new dad within 12 months. So, you know, all of us, we're all special snowflakes, all six sided snowflakes, just like every other special, unique snowflake. So Napier got yeeted for underappreciation of Thunderbirds. Yeah, like you can't appreciate uh team america world police unless you had an appreciation for thunderbirds you can't appreciate the old hulk and spider-man and captain america cartoons from the 70s unless you can appreciate thunderbirds thunderbirds kind of started the whole serial cheaply produced american television animation thing it's got a charm to it <laughs> thunderbirds wasn't trying to be funny it was trying to beat the communists Anyways, whatever. We're not going to sit here and argue about Thunderbirds for the next hour. I think we got better things to do with her. I hope we have better things to do with our time. Yeah, so Dread, it gets through these things. So for a lot of you guys who may be new and you don't understand, like, that's the point. That's why that's why you're working out. That's why you're on a cut. That's why you're trying to get muscular. It's not because you're trying to win your wife back. It's because no men are in shape. Like, I'm not even saying you have to have a six-pack abs or you have to have, like, a chest that's a barrel. I'm saying... If you're not fat and you have like a decent muscular frame, you are already in the top 5% of men. That's the difference between a Louis Vuitton purse and a and a Walmart special, you know? That's why you're not learning game to try and pick up your wife. You're learning that because you learn to be charismatic, you need to be, learn to be charming, you need to have, 
You learn to develop these social skills that no men have. Most men are borderline autistic. They're overly literal. They aren't funny. They don't tell the good stories. They're not interesting. They're not engaging. They're not emotionally engaging. There's a reason. Dude, uh, there's like a trending video right now on YouTube from an uh, internet historian about a dude caught in a cave. I, I know you've probably, a lot of you have probably watched it. You might know the one I'm talking about. If not, go look it up. My girl and I were watching this. It was like an hour long video of a dude who climbed into a cave, got a rock stuck on his foot, and then like the whole state of Kentucky tried to save him for like three weeks. Goddamn compelling. Goddamn compelling. And it's, if you're able to do that in your day-to-day -day activities, you become a more compelling person. People want to be around you more. It's like, tell better stories. The same as we were talking before about the article, um, I can't even. Yeah, I can tell a great story, right? Now imagine, now that, if you want to talk about pickup, ultimately, that's what pickup is. You're learning to tell really good stories, you know, physically with your body language, through touch, through spo spoken words, all that shit. But you're doing it in a way that's guided towards what you want, sex, right? So in the same way that you know, you're not learning it to win back your wife, you're learning it because these skills make you more attractive. They turn you into the Louis Vuitton purse, not the Walmart special. Not rewarding good behavior, rewarding bad behavior. Again, you're just putting expectations on it. That's the other half of it, that and boundaries you're learning too. Yes, I've built up all these attractive skills, all these masculine luxury skills that aren't, you know, commodities. They're rare. They're rare. They're solely masculine. That's why I like being emotionally stable. That's like a huge thing. Girls are emotional. They cry and they walk around and like whatever. I don't care. It's not a bad thing. It's just the way they are. But as a guy, because you have testosterone, you actually have muted emotional responses to things. For an 8 out of 10 panic event in a girl's mind is like a 2 out of 10 panic event in a guy's mind. It's not that the it's not that it's different for men and women. It's just that we react differently. So the fact that you can react so much more um, measured to these neurotic events is seen as a benefit because you actually, with the stronger frame, the girl starts to lose her anxiety and feels more comfortable around you. Those are beta traits, right? So oh, it's great. I can feel safe around him. You ever heard that? Like, I always feel safe around this guy. But you don't want to do too much of it either because then if the girl is too safe, she gets bored. And if she gets bored, she starts to, you know, sleep with the neighbors. So every now and then, you know, a little jolt of anxiety and pulling the anxiety. It's called push and pull. And being able to do that without having to think about it too much, like just having it naturally apply because you've kind of built your life in such a way that you naturally push and pull people away. These work because nobody does it. It's like that Louis Vuitton purse shit. Dude, I love this guy. He always makes me feel safe. Oh, I hate him. He's driving me nuts. She has to go bitch about it to her friends. Then the next day she's glad to see you. And then she's crying and then she's not. You can handle it all. You don't really care. In fact, sometimes you're even like inciting these events, but that's just game. Yeah, a little bit of manufactured drama. And it's better to be manufactured because you're in control of it. It's proactive. It's better to have manufactured drama than reactive drama. Your girl starts freaking out and crying over nothing. And now you got to figure this out. You're always on the back foot. If you create a little bit of drama because you had, because you've had enough of a shit, then oh, it's just whatever. It's five minutes, five minutes out of your day to be more attractive. Who, who would say no? So yeah, what you were finding is a lot of these guys were coming up with all these different methods and tips, tips and tricks and strategies and mental models about surrounding the idea of never being taken for granted, being sexually attractive, building the luxury, the luxury branding model of masculinity, and then attaching expectations and boundaries to it. And all of dread has essentially been details on that now i could give you like a speech on this but it'd be a four hour rollo live stream and i don't want to waste your time like that i'm writing it down in a book i promise i promise so don't worry about it but that's kind of where you end up going at the end of this and that's all you're trying to do anyways so we're gonna move on to there i i don't have any of my actually you know what we'll add one i gotta re-add all of the damned uh videos so i'm so annoyed I was so happy that I had all the people. Let's get Boba Chick. There you go. 
one of the guys who ran the red pill channel sent me a message i actually appreciate that you took it from an idea-based perspective instead of ever resorting to personal attack like if this movement is actually going to be dangerous do we need to understand it so that we can take it down i knew going into it that this might be a hot mess i'm not gonna have those guys back on my channel again absolutely not belongs in the streets any girl calling me a cult leader <laughs> all right so what are we on now like 115 i think something like that I only have this one scheduled for an hour and a half, so we'll do some bands at the end, but once it starts to wind down, we'll call it, just so you know. Put you, put you, and archetypes. This is actually one of my favorite parts of this. Well, I mean, it's not cognitive dissonance that her audience had a fucking temper tantrum, so she wanted to keep her audience, so she kind of had to, like, tell them what they wanted to hear. That's the pandering thing. It's another reason why I hate your audience a bit. I don't want you guys deciding what my content is. I'll do that on my own. All right, you can have a top-up for the coffees if you guys have one already. If not... So the archetypes. There's very few archetypes. It's not alpha and beta, honestly. And I was calling them in the book, I called it Chad and Billy. And they are why I enjoy this, because it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter how well you've done. It doesn't matter how good you are. Everybody ends up with the same. Yeah, they might be a little bit, but it gets your attention, I guess. So I'll just leave it or I'll fiddle with it later. So, yeah, and it doesn't matter any of that stuff. You always end up with the same position, same problems, the same tips and tricks and all that stuff. And I was realizing this because you see some guys, they were in the, the red pill or the married red pill. And they were like, yeah, I was, I'm tall. I'm attractive. I earn good money. You know, I, I had all the chicks back in college. And then they have like this harpy shrew wife. Doesn't sleep with them. Maybe he gained some weight, thyroid problem, something like that he had to deal with. And then there's other guys who were like, I never really had many girls growing up. And, you know, I had to work really hard. I made myself like a doctor or a lawyer or something crazy like that. And finally this girl i had a huge crush on she was 32 she wanted a family we got married had a kid six months later and then sex just dropped off and i'm and then i just realized like all these guys are exact like completely different you would look at one as like oh that's an alpha male and you look at the one they're like ah oh, simp and they're all in the exact same situation so that kind of tells me if doesn't matter how good you are doesn't matter how bad you are doesn't matter how good your job is how strong you are how tall you are how many abs you have this is all just like the male condition. And so it's just like, okay, so it's consistent, but that's good. If it's consistent and everybody has it the same, that means there is solutions that work for everybody. Yeah, I know, I know. All right, we'll crank the volume up just to touch on the mic anyway. I, I used to have these just dialed right in, the stupid computer, we'll fix them anyway. Yeah, so it's all the same. It turns out if you're a top tier guy, you're aloof. You don't have to learn anything. You don't have to know why women are the way they are because they always give you everything without a fight because you're just that valuable because, you know, the six foot tall rich guy doesn't come by every day. So everybody wants to treat you right. And if they don't treat you right, there's somebody else who's willing to treat you right. And so you're just like, ah, eh, you get rid of that one, get the new one. You have like ultimate abundance. When you see guys, and I'll use the branding example, like AJ Cortez, tall Cro-Magnon features, you know, Kind of a bit of a bimbo. Girls are all over that shit. I've had wingmen that were like that, and it was fucking frustrating. Just had to sit there and smile. Meanwhile, I'm running game like a madman, and it's like, dude, he's still crushing me. <laughs> Nothing I can do. Turns out, though, like, a lot of the girls were like, dude, it's like talking to a plank of wood, and then they ended up liking me afterwards, but it still took work. And I was, I don't want to say sloppy seconds, because there's no sloppiness there, but... Like, in the game, it was always, yeah. But here's the thing. He never had to learn how to be in control. He never had to learn to dominate in a relationship. He never had to. He just had to be aloof and girls give him everything. And when you're single, yeah, of course. Oh, dude, that guy, he's so dreamy, he's so hot. The friends all liked him. He's basically a luxury good. But that wears off. Once you're married, once you have kids, the threat of you leaving is gone. That's the only tool he had in his toolbox was that I can leave and replace you with somebody younger and hotter. But you know, most guys aren't psychopaths. They love their kids. They love their family. They married a girl and they love her. So yeah, why wouldn't they stick around and do their best? But all of his traditional aloofness doesn't work anymore. And he's never had to learn another way. He's never seen women at their worst. So when women start acting at their worst, 
it changes his whole worldview. That's where a lot of guys get zeroed out. Like, I watched my stepfather go through it. He was king dingling. But then as soon as, like, you know, something went against that worldview of how he thought of everything, he kind of had a temper tantrum. And most guys respond not with... When we need help the most is when we tend to act the worst and other people want to help us the least. Because we get angry. Anger is like the standard emotion if we don't know how to react to something. We get angry. It's our social way of saying, whatever you guys are doing, cut that shit out or I'm going to get violent. And nowadays, any guy getting angry pisses off so many people that they call the cops. So you're like, it doesn't work anymore. So you have to come up with a better way. Now, generally speaking, you should have a father or a priest or an older brother or friends or something like that to lean on. But those are gone. Like, did you know most millennials right now don't have one friend? Like, I think it's 80% or something stupid like that. Don't have one friend that they could call. One good friend. That sucks. I don't even know what Zoomers have. They probably don't even... Like, they don't even have one anime waifu that they can send an OnlyFans check to. Like, that's how bad it's gotten. Zoomers or Gen Xs are probably a bit better, but you know what I mean? So there's no friends. You can't talk about the church. The church will spend Father's Day telling you how you guys need to be more subservient to women. And Mother's Day telling you how you need to worship women better. They're telling single guys to join the church and hold on to it. And then the only women that come into the church are the ones that offer for, that want forgiveness. Here, this drug-addled single mom, you can make her a good Christian woman. You go get her, son. Guys are just like, no, fuck that. I'm out of here. Why would I pay full price for used goods on a girl who doesn't really need me? She just needs redemption. Yeah, it's weird, right? Thing in the Netherlands about people not having friends. I thought people are sexing left and right. I mean, they are. But it depends which people you're talking about. Again, we can do the Pareto thing. I get that. Most guys aren't having sex. Well, not most. 30% of guys aren't having sex. And then... Uh, 50. So, like, 50% of guys are having okay sex. If they're in a relationship, it's a little bit. Nobody's happy, but it's better than nothing. And then the top 20% per guy, percent of guys are picking up the slack, sleeping with everybody. So generally speaking. You have a close circle of friends. I am the 20%. Sadly enough, that's it. That's why I always laugh with this whole, like, dude, you got to be better than everybody. I'm like, do you know how shitty everybody is right now? If your pants are, are a 36 or less, you're basically in the top 5% of Americans for fitness. All you need is a size 36 waist. <laughs> I think the average American man is like a 42 or something like that. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? The average guy has slept with was it three to seven girls in his lifetime or no three girls in his lifetime the average girl is seven so if you have a notch count of four you're in like uh the top 50 percent if you have a notch count of seven you're officially as as sexually active as a girl who's lying about her notch count <laughs> yeah i don't think people realize this because you don't see everybody you just see your circle of people and then people don't realize how shitty the average person is the average person is emotional the average person is drunk. Dude, Fort Worth Playboy, my favorite thing is where he lives. He has like a bunch of like upper middle class, well-to-do people, but it's in Texas. So it's surrounded by some, you know, like working class people too. And he's just like, everybody is drunk. Everybody is drunk. And not just, I had some drinks over dinner. It's like, I just polished off a two, four for dinner. Like they're just drunk. Everybody's drunk. Everybody's fat. Everybody's sexually unfulfilled. And all you have to do is just like do like the bare minimum to get to like what you would consider to be average and you're essentially exceptional how sad is that dude i'm sitting here i'm sitting here playing minecraft and running my mouth about whamming and that's my career like don't tell me it's too hard out there you can handle it you just got to do it like properly and professionally threes and sevens are you thinking about the uh queens of the stone age one maybe that's what he was talking about yeah <laughs> but I do have a nice shirt. Well, thank you very much, sir. My girl hates this one. I like it. My my Japanese woodprint shirt. She hates it. Like, I like it, though. Anyway, so yeah. So you got these archetypes. Some men are top-tier men. Some men are what you would think of as simps. They all have a path to get into a relationship. They all have a path to build a family. They all have a path to settle down. And then when you get there, it's the exact same problems. Because, yeah, you're top-tier. And that's all it takes. Sometimes it's out of your control. Like uh, 2008, perfect example. A lot of top tier dudes worked in the construction industry or with mortgages, finances, you know, attractive, fit, charming, you know, built, 
rich, tall, all that shit. 2008 happens, housing crisis happens, and there was a big thing where the construction industry, it's like 80% of it just disappeared overnight, and a lot of it still has not come back. So imagine this. You have all your value built in. I can provide. I got a good family and I got abundance. And then through something environmental that's of no fault of your own, that's all gone. These guys end up getting hooked on Oxy. Their wives start to get bitchy. They start to leave them. And they're like, I don't get it. He was Chad. Chad is supposed to have the safe world life. It's like, no, not necessarily. Uh, is the server open or private on Minecraft? It's got It's got a fee. It's just a small fee on the membership tab. So that way it can cover the server costs. And then the idea is there's like five tiers of server. And so I've priced it. So as it hits like enough people where I need the next tier of server that it, it pays for itself. So yeah, it's, I'm not making money off of it. It's essentially just paying for itself. And then usually there's like a little bit left over. And so I'll run contests for guys to get some free merch. Plus it's nice. Like, I'm not going to lie when, uh, when Dave built that, that shrine to MLD John, on the Manosphere contest. Fuck, I've never laughed so hard in my goddamn life. But yeah, get in and join. It'd be kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> fucking guys. Yeah, I've been a 30-inch waist my whole life at 6 foot, 46 years old. Guys, I need to slim down. I can't find another 30 by 34 at the Goodwill anymore. All fat boy pants. Well, you gotta learn to be hemming your clothes. Get, get to become a good couturier or tailor. I should start calling it couturier because the French one makes it sound much less effeminate than saying you're you're a seamstress. Uh, so that's good. So that lets you know, like nobody gets out of this game. We're all in the same game. Do what you got to do. And we are just about on time. I am four minutes ahead of schedule. God damn it. Here I was thinking I was pretty good at marking this stuff. So this next part, the idea is I'm shutting it down on the 90-minute the mark, but I figure we're going to spend some time just shoot the shit and do some bands together. So if you're the guy that's just here to learn the content and get the F out, thank you for showing up. Uh, after this, this video is going straight to... I'm, I'm testing and I've tested the raid feature. So the next one is going to be MLD John Rule Zero. It should lead you directly there after the video starts. If it doesn't, let me know. <laughs> But I actually kind of like that. So we'll be able to, you know, transition people. So yeah, we're do the bands thing. So yeah, just throw stuff at me. If you want focus, give me a super chat. Otherwise, it's as time permits. I'll answer stuff. <laughs> What's the worst shirt you got? I don't have a bad shirt. Even my bad shirts are awesome. I don't know. I had to go through my... Honestly, I had to go through my wardrobe now. Because I don't have a huge amount of closet space. Because I live downtown Toronto. But um, so what I do is I'll have like summer clothes. And then I have winter clothes. And then one goes into storage, the other, like, into, like, a container with a vacuum bag and put it in a thing under the bed. And then stuff for the summer. There's some that works for both seasons, but some that doesn't. So my summer stuff is a lot of Hawaiian shirts, a lot of, like, short sleeve Henleys, T-shirts. And then lots of, like, pinks, reds, blues, and greens. Then as the, the winter comes in, it's going to be longer sleeve Henleys, jerseys, sweaters, Shoebox living in Toronto. You know what? It's not bad. Like, my first condo, I bought it in Victoria, BC. It was a 1,300 square foot two bedroom. And it was too much room for me. Like, I had big parties. Like, I'd invite, like, 20 friends over when I was in the military and have, like, have a party. They bring their girlfriends and shit. It was big enough for that. I had a nice, like, big patio with a garden out back. It was nice. But it was just too much space to clean. And it ended up just having, like, a lot of emptiness to it. And the second bedroom, I just didn't even use it. I I eventually got a roommate just so the just so the room wouldn't sit there collecting dust. I'm like I just need somebody in there to keep the keep the light on every now and again. Yeah, then we moved to Montreal and it was like uh we downgraded into a uh, one bedroom with a walk-in closet at like 900 square feet and that was a pretty comfortable size. The place here is about the same. It's under 1000 square feet, but it's I don't know, it's comfortable. And I know a lot of guys hate that size thing, but I kind of like being more efficient with your space. Because I hate, I hate clutter, man. I hate clutter. I hate how guys get garages and they just end up filling it with shit. And there's a spare bedroom that's just full of shit. And I'm like, if I haven't touched it in a year, I clearly don't want it. So all I'm doing is paying money into a mortgage for space that I don't need to have stuff that I don't want. That just makes me look more like a fucking hoarder. 
Now, granted, I think, I don't know, a little bit more square footage would be all right, but I do like how everything we have is like efficiently placed right now. So like the linens go here, the clothes go here. We kind of have to be more on the ball. And yeah, it's like, yeah, it's minimalism. Exactly. Dude, 2,900 square feet. I wouldn't even know what to do with that space. Like I would have rooms that are just there to be rooms. 4,300 square feet. Dude, what would I even do? I, how do you clean that? Seriously, how do you clean it? Full of nonsense. What would I even do with it? The best I can do is I would like, I would probably make an extended size office where I could run like skets, sketches, sketches in here and stuff. Yeah, you can hire somebody. But see what I mean? You're paying money for square footage that you have to pay somebody to clean and they have to buy more stuff to fill. It's just like, I don't need any of that stuff air compressor next to a fireplace because man i'm not even shitting on you like whatever if you like it go fill your boots i just wouldn't know what to do like at this point if i had more square footage i would end up just picking up random hobbies like i would start brewing my own beer if i had like an extra basement suite or i would like extend the size of the studio but that would be more like a business expense at that point i could just get some like commercial space and do the same thing turn one room into a sewing room but it's just like superfluous not really needed at this point, it's very easy for me to drag the sewing machine out, do it in the living room, and then put it all away, right? Like, even when I was uh, single in that 1,300 square feet place and the one bedroom was done, all I did was I put a 12-foot white leather sectional sofa in the middle of it, set up all the entertainment stuff, and then that just became the party room. That was it. I never even was in there very much. I'm a consistent purger myself. Even when I owned a house, I would clean garage twice a year can't stand clutter and filth yeah and don't get me wrong i like, guess the one thing with small spaces that it's uh it's interesting like it very quickly gets turns into a disaster like right now our living room we have like a couple loads of laundry in there we got to fold and put away this weekend it looks like a, a, a shit show but after about half an hour of cleaning it it's it's spotless again like one load of dishes make it look like you're living in a disaster zone because it's so small it's easy to look messy but it's easier to clean I have one room that's literally 500 square feet and nothing in it. I will say this. For those like New York and uh, San Francisco 500 square foot places, they're too small, man. Like I'm all up for not having extra space, but those are the ones where like they don't even have enough space for the essentials. Like I would argue you need an adequately sized kitchen, even if it's just a galley kitchen. You need an adequately sized bathroom. You need adequate like closet storage. But if you're at the point that you have to, like, store clothes underneath the couch, it's like, ah, that's no, too small. It's way too small. Or you have to set up one of those bedrooms that's, like, it's a closet, but then on top of it, you have a mattress on top of the closet. Like, I'm all for efficiency, but at that point, you're just fucking with people. Yeah, just moved. I opening my stuff you keep. The one thing that was nice, too. So, I used to move a lot. Like, girl and I have always been nomadic. Uh, moved across half the country over the last decade. And... We had a giant amount of Tupperware containers and boxes. The idea being, when we had to move, we had enough containers to store all of our stuff. And it was like, all fit into one U-Haul. And so we were kind of forced to not buy or own things we didn't need. And it was a super efficient. It's like, oh, it's time to pack. You know, this box goes for this, this box goes for this, this container goes for this. Everything's packed. It's almost like a Tetris thing. Yeah, one room I live in, two tables, one for work, DIY fixing shit, a bed, couple shelves, a wardrobe, and a stereo workshop where it'd be nice if I were rich. Yeah, but that's the point. It's like, you don't need the workshop. It'd be just something fun to do. If you have to keep the sex doll under the couch, it's too small. Uh, rule zero is going to be John. I'm actually doing the raid after this, so you should be automatically redirected to that one when it comes up, so that'll be good. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. I don't like it's like everything in your house needs to be functional. I love things for aesthetic purposes. If you guys don't know, prior to my military time, I was actually a graphic artist with a degree in art history. And my house is full of art. Like I've got my own paint. I've got paintings that I've, I've, when did I do those? I think I painted them in like the 2000s. I have those in my wall. I have masks that I've collected over my travels across the world. Like I've got masks from just about every continent. I think I'm missing Africa. And Antarctica, but I don't think I'm going to get one from there. Speaking of which, we were supposed to... Oh, that's right, the Scottish ones. So we got a bunch of that stuff. We got, like, lithographs. We got some stuff we picked up in the Chicago Museum of Art. Like a bunch of Lichtenstein... Or not Lichtenstein... No, Lichtensteins and Warhols. 
I got some deer antlers that I picked up when we went to South Dakota back in back in the Mount Rushmore days. It's like a lot of those kind of things, but I like that. So everything aesthetic in my house has a story behind it. So it's great if you have you over. I could literally just like talk to you for four hours over why that's there or why there's some why there's some Dutch clogs in the corner or why, you know, what that painting is about. And I can describe that. And I like that stuff. It's the one thing I will always like making room for. Because if you're in a place that's too utilitarian, it just becomes stale and boring. And there's no, there's no purpose to it. It's like telling better stories. The same thing there. If you have a house that has... N like, if I couldn't tell you lived in a place just by looking at your place, then I don't think you're doing it right. There needs to be a, per a part of your personality that's reflected in where you live. That's the only reason I hate those sad MGTOW apartments. You know, the ones that just like a milk crate and a TV and a sofa. There's like nothing there. I couldn't tell you who that was. That's not a person. That's just a meat bag that earns money and buys food. Uh, Tom Canuck here moved out of his four bedroom house to a two bedroom apartment, rented out the house, easier to clean, making profit on the rent and saving a lot of utilities. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, surrounded by signed comic book art. And you know what? Like, look, some guys say, oh, that's juvenile and stupid or whatever. But I'll say this. Con Savage, if I knew you as a person and then I saw your place, I'm like, yeah, that's his place. Like, it, it is a reflection of who you are. And it's the same thing with, like, clothes, style, fashion. Like, I wear a lot of loud, boisterous shirts and I'm obviously loud and obnoxious. <laughs> so, like, that makes sense. Then the art and that kind of thing there. Same as you, right? Yeah, it's a personality thing. Now, you could say maybe good, maybe bad. Like, if you have a bunch of, like, sex dolls hanging off your wall, then maybe, you know, maybe don't invite me over for Christmas, but whatever. And I know a lot of girls like to change that stuff, too. It always gets me when you see, like, girls like, ah, I want to make your bathroom pink or something like that. <laughs> I just got Ryan's style. Yeah, but that's the point. See, like, I don't have to say that. You just have to watch me. Like, you watch me. Like, as soon as you see me, what do you see? You see this big loud red shirt right so you're going to assume this guy behind it is going to be running his mouth you don't think of it that way it's all subconscious but if i were to sit here all like um quiet and reserved and i don't make any contact with the camera and that it would it would just seem weird to you it's like why is this guy dressed like a megaphone talking to me like in whispered tones no you kind of need me to be like in your face or like louder but fun right like it's not like a, a punisher shirt on the top where and in fairness, guys who wear those, no offense to you guys, but those guys that wear the Punisher shirts are, I want to look tough, but my only reference of toughness is a comic book written by another nerd. <laughs> yeah. So it's one of those things too I like that nobody really talks about when we talk about style and how you dress. It's like, it's a communication system. How I dress tells you things. And so how you guys dress tells you things. When you walk up to a girl... She's looked at your hair, she's looked at your shoes, she's looked at your sunglasses, she's looked at your pants, she's looked at your shirt, she's looked at your shoe. I uh, already said shoes, your socks. And she already has an impression, like, what archetype of man is this? And then you walk up, she's either receptive to you because she likes that archetype, or she's not receptive and she's not. But if you're incongruent with that, they don't know how to react to it, they can't put their finger on it. It usually just comes out as the word creepy. So yeah, it's one of those things to work on. Uh, Ryan, your stream is getting cut. God damn it, again? I had that one hiccup right in the halfway part of the stream, and now it's all messed up. Anyways. Yeah, it's time to it's time to change the servers. Uh, I thought they were cutting gas lines, not internet weird. Well, I mean, it's Canada. We do all kinds of things. Here is Chicago Hill. Okay, so that might just be on your end. Sorry, cease it. So I like, I would hope, I would hope at the end of this stuff, you guys have heard me run my mouth. You guys hear me talk about a lot of convoluted, you know, pseudo-intellectual topics or whatever. And, I'm, and there's utility of it. Like, there's too many guys in here who have benefited from it for me not to think that. But I do hope at the end you guys start to get an appreciation for your own lives that just didn't happen before, or at least wasn't articulated before. Uh, Dark Knight Dev, thank you, sir, for the super chat. Same here. Turned my garage into a man cave. Heavy bags, refrigerator, barbecue, grill, and a TV. Even though I don't have a relationship, I wear a lot of plain tees, different colors, so I definitely understand. 
Yeah. Now, see, like, that's that's a look. You can argue whether you would like it or whether you don't or whether it helps you or hurts you or has no effect in your dating life, but that's a look. Like, I walk into there, I see a guy who, like, at least casually boxes. Loves, like, you know, barbecue and meat and stuff like that. Kind of like a dude bro. Now, the plain D is different colors. It's muted. It's understated. So... It's better than the standard look. Like, the one standard look, I always hate this one. It's, like, where guys just wear hoodies and jeans. Hoodies, jeans, sneakers. It's, like, the everyman, the gray man, where there's, like, nothing about it that stands out. Like, say what you will about t-shirts being a plain piece of clothing. At least a t-shirt, like, shows what kind of shape you're in. A hoodie hides all that shit. Uh, dressing up the garage is a cool thing to do, no matter what stage of life you're in. I mean, it's it's... There's two ways of looking at it. There's guys that make the man cave because they're hiding from their families and their wife is in control of the house. And I absolutely think that's ridiculous. The guys who have that. But then there's some guys who have like, it, they just treat it like it's another room. It's, how would I want to decorate this room if I had my choice? In fairness, if I had a garage, I would probably turn it into an art studio because linseed, I love the smell of linseed oil. I haven't done oil paintings in forever. You'd have it is kind of like an art studio is nice because it's like half wood shop, half painting. So you have that wood smell too and all that. It's just I don't know, it's a it's a it's a look. And if you guys don't have this, look here. I'll tell you right now. If you guys ever get uh, in your kitchen like wooden cutting boards or butcher block countertops, if you don't know, you're supposed to oil them because the 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 water sucks moisture out of it and then the wood kind of goes away. It starts to warp. So you want to oil it on a regular basis. And I will tell you this. Out of all the oils you can use, you know, it's mineral oil, there's uh, cutting board oil, get yourself some boiled linseed oil. Don't get the rocks, if I'm not mistaken. And double check this, because it's been a while. But raw linseed oil is poisonous. But boiled linseed oil is not poisonous. It's food safe. There's a smell to it. And once you smell it, it's like a unique smell. I love that smell. It's my favorite smell that nobody else knows what the fuck I'm talking about. You can usually pick them up at like... Uh, Hardware supply stores, because a lot of people use it like teak oil, like a finishing oil. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Alex. Yeah, no wonder my cutting board's age bad. Like, here, Matt, I'll put it this way. My cutting board? You've seen it in my cooking videos. I bought that cutting board in 1997 for 20 bucks. I still have that cutting board. What's it? 97? That's like 25 years I've had that same cutting board. Now, I've had, like, hot pans put on it. I've got, like charred rings from the pans i've got hundreds of thousands of nicks and cuts and gashes and but yeah here it is still is it's still going strong after like that long and it's crazy yeah i've noticed people comment on any attempt to dress better as a whole everyone just rocks comfortable clothes now and that's the thing comfortable can even be good looking now like even and i hate to say it and i'll never get behind it but like jogging pants like you know that jogging pant look there's some guys that make it look kind of stylish right now like, my brother can do jogging pants and a hoodie and make it look good. I still can't figure it out. But then again, he was also the guy that used to wear, like, uh, those three-quarter length capri pants. So I'm like, I don't know how he does it. Yeah, I know what you mean. T uh, tongue oil, similar scent, but also oxidizes waterproof. I'm pretty sure tongue oil isn't uh, food safe, so I wouldn't suggest using that. But double check that. Hey, what's up, guys? later hosen what the hell you guys are throwing out random words right now but you know what i mean it's like the fact that i can talk about my kitchen and have a story about my cutting board i know that sounds stupid but it's like if you're able to do that with everything in your life it makes it much easier to be an interesting person because you're interesting like dude i'll even my knickknack wall like i know every every uh, talking head on youtube has a knickknack wall right but what do they do they do like the Donovan Sharp thing. There's a Muhammad Ali picture. There's some boxing gloves. I've never boxed. There's brick on the background and a Miller Light poster. And it's, it's like it doesn't really say anything. It's just like generic guy shit. Well, I should hope you're interesting, John, at this point. By the way, John, just so you know, the, uh, the stream is set up for a raid. So we're going to raid you when this thing is done. But like I can look at this right now. Like obviously the book's up here. It's the, it's the guys from Rule Zero. Until John gets a book, then he'll be on there. Uh, squash Racket. The globe, uh, the map there, I am I still have to do it. I have to put, like, all the countries I've been to on it. There'll be, like, 20 of them. I want to set up, like, little red lines and shit. There's my Pusser's Rum decanter. 
bought that in my first foreign port and I drank it on my last day in the military. Like has a history to that one. There's my old teaching books, my shadow box. I can go through the medals, how I earned them, what I did, the rank and the trade and all that stuff. Over here is my uh, Order of Magellan, Order of the Ditch, Order of Heracles, and what's the other one? Oh, I can't see it from here. But I got that from sailing around the world, going in between the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, crossing the date timeline. You get a whole bunch of like little sailing awards on that. No shame, I'm not being able to read, but impressed you can type and not read. What? That's weird. <laughs> but yeah, just try but just try it. Like try to be interesting, to do interesting shit, to have like a curiosity about things. To the point that yeah, you're willing to put your t-shirt away, away and wear like a giant pink fucking polo shirt with palm trees on it. The fact that you're willing to have a a cutting board that you have like an artistic level of like connection with, a painting in your house that you've made yourself, a bunch of books, a military career, like all these kind of things. Like, how could you not experience life as in? And you don't have to like, if I don't own a Bugatti with this, it's not about shit you buy. It's about the shit you've done. And the more shit you do that other people don't do, the more you push yourself towards that luxury brand, right? Become a worldly Renaissance man kind of person. Like I can tell, I can, I've literally sailed around, the, circumnavigated the globe on a boat. Nobody gets to say that. And that makes a good story. And that makes you more interesting. And that makes you more two-dimensional or even three-dimensional. But you don't want to be the one-dimensional guy that's like, uh, yeah, there's whiskey and truck nuts and nonsense bullshit in the background there. Like Nick, he's in the chat here. He said it himself where he's, he used to, he used to run startups as a CIO and he's like repair them and fix them and then sell them off and make money from it. That's something interesting. Not a lot of people have been C-suite. Exactly. Truck nut masculinity. Not many people have been C-suite. John, he packed up everything, moved to the other side of the country in a language and a culture he's unfamiliar with and carved himself out of life. You can say you like that. You can say you don't like it. But the one thing you can't say is it's not interesting. Even Tate, who I really hate that I have to put in a good word for here. <laughs> like he has done, I think, professional kickboxing. At the very least, amateur. Like to the point where you're on TV. He's done kickboxing. He's uh, run a cam studio with cam girls and shit like that. So basically like YouTube with titties. You don't have to like it. You don't have to hate it. But it is interesting. Granted, the human trafficking accusations, if those end up being true, I would argue maybe stop short of committing international felonies, but it's at least interesting. Like, it's it's easier to talk about that. So, yeah. Uh, I've attempted stand-up and pro wrestling. People love hearing about those things. Dude, I would love to hear about those things. Those are nice. It's one of those things. I almost did stand-up when I was at 21Con. There was, like, a comedy club there. It's like, fuck, I should just walk in and wing it on an open mic night. It was closed, but whatever. It's on those things. It's on the list. Can I put truck nuts on a Honda CRV? It'll be a story, man. Also, Honda CRV, isn't that the. Oh, no, I'm thinking CRX. Is that what the CRX is called now? I gotta look this up. Oh, dude. How did they make the Honda CRX look so ugly? I mean, no offense. No, no offense. It's the SUV, yeah. I'm not an SUV guy. That's my thing. I thought you were going to say a CRX. I'm like, that was the coolest shit back in the day. You should try to be a comedian. It's on the list of like things that I may do one day at some point. It'll be kind of fun. Carl was great at stand-up. Yeah. But it's like everything. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. Even Richard commented about that. Yeah, dude, I, I miss Rich on the thing. I wish he'd come back. Oh, well. Let him do his thing. He's living his life. Anyways, I'm going to let you go. We're going to go to rule zero here in about 30 minutes. So this should lead you directly there. And I'll catch you guys later. Oh, perfect. It does do it.